Bonjour. <laughs> you didn't greet people in Bulgarian in Sofia, so <laughs> just to be clear. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for making time uh, to listen to us talk about everything except WordPress. Because you can ask him all the questions directly in the Q&A session. Though we do have a little WordPress to get started with. Yes. You know, you took my lead into that, but it's OK. Uh, that's what friends do, right? So again, um, I just wanted to give you one second uh, of my WordPress involvement. I was, I think, patient maybe one of the first five or 10 people to download the original WordPress and then install it on my server. And then since then, Matt has been my private sysadmin. And so that's his claim to fame. Uh, but uh, it's, it's great to see what started as such a small project with six people become so big and so huge that we have a packed audience. So take a minute and give yourself a round of applause because you guys are what make WordPress so awesome. So thank you. So Matt, you are amongst your people and I believe you have a little gift for them. We do, we do. So who here has heard of the Gutenberg editor so far? Okay, a couple. Who's seen it? Fewer. Who's installed it on their sites? Couple. This is pretty good. Well, I think we have a little video we can roll, right? For those watching at home and for those who are uh, perhaps seeing it for the first time, I want to give a little bit of a preview of what is coming with the Gutenberg editor, which is the fruit of our first main focus uh, for the year. So here you see it replaces the entire right screen. Look. What just happened was there was an insert. You can click. We're choosing two images. We're creating a gallery. You see the little arrows next to things? Those are blocks. So the blocks can be moved up and down. See, so we've got dynamic blocks. So things that are currently widgets can be turned into blocks. We're about to insert a block of the latest post. You can see below that a HR block, a button block. It's being moved around. It's being populated dynamically. The button block, is, I think, is actually going to be a really popular one. It's the simplest thing in the world, but very challenging, especially if you don't have HTML or, or want to tweak with CSS to be able to add that sort of thing. Turning this into a quote with a citation. This is going by pretty quickly, because there's a lot to show. And um, this kind of block-based editor, uh, we still retain the flexibility and ease of editing as before. So if you're in a text block, you just press Enter twice, and you're in a new paragraph or a new block. You can select multiple blocks, which we're doing here, and actually move all of those around. So this is uh, the very, very first thing we're sort of w ready to show to the world of the blocks. Of course, it works on mobile. So this is a little preview of the mobile version of it. Because of course, I can't have anything that doesn't work on mobile anymore. Uh, but you'll see the exact same UI patterns, the exact same kind of ideas of what's going on, uh, working perfectly in a mobile context as well. The cool thing about this is that for those of you all watching out at home or admitting, system in your blog on your phone, this is now available in the WordPress plugin directory. <laughs> it's just looping now. You can stop it. <laughs> so. Uh, as of before I got on stage, it had fewer than 10 active sites in the world. So we'll see how many it has at the, uh, the end of the talk. I think that value is cached for like 24 hours. But by tomorrow or the next day, I hope we can get that up there. The purpose is to, uh, we can stop the video. I don't know where AV is. <laughs> um, the purpose is that we built this in a way that we can have it gestate and be used as a while as a plugin. And um, so we want as many people trying this out as possible. And we're going to build a lot more types of blocks. Um, and this is the basis for, of course, what's going to be the future customization. So blocks will replace widgets. Blocks will replace kind of all the other fundamentals and primitives inside WordPress until everything is a block. Well done. So a couple of comments. Are those my images you guys are using? 
<laughs> Sorry. They look Are very familiar. Um, they might be some of your photos. Okay. <laughs> Just want to make sure who to send the bill to. <laughs> Not everything in life is open source. Hold the, uh, hold the mic a little closer. So, I'm, I'm sure, you know, I'm going to be politically incorrect for a minute. I, you know, Medium should just, you know, close shop right now, don't they? Shouldn't they? Well, what I'm hoping is that, you know, Medium started five or six years ago. Um, browser technology, which you can do, has advanced quite a bit. Uh, I think that this actually allows us to leapfrog past some of the really great visual editors that, because we're able to build on the shoulders of things like Medium, Wix, Squarespace, other people that have come before us and say, okay, building this today in 2017, uh, what's the very best experience that you can have? Um, I'm also just so, so, so proud of the team, you know, led by Johan and Matthias, but with many others contributing at how far this has come. So we're about six months in on here. Uh, the previous attempt that uh, we made, or I made, to replace Tiny MC went about two years, and we ended up not shipping it. <laughs> so this happening in six months and being available to you all to run on your blogs today, uh, It'll add a, a menu to your sidebar, so there'll be a Gutenberg menu item. Um, is to me, I'm just so, so proud of the team and so, so excited about what we'll be able to do over the coming months. So, you know, jokes aside, you know, I have like no problems with Medium. And, uh, but what I, I do like the idea of having a very clean interface for editing, writing, and creating a website. When will this become standard, like, interface for uh, WordPress going forward? It's a good question. Um, I posted a little bit about this on both the Make Core blog and on my own blog, uh, ma.tt. We should say our Twitter handles, too. You're at Ohm, which is like the coolest Twitter handle probably in the room, maybe in the world. <laughs> I'm at Photomat. Uh, so you can visit those and see the latest post. But I think that you know we did a 4.8 release just last week. Ooh. <laughs> Um, that went pretty well, and uh, we were able to get some nice, uh, especially customization-related improvements into Core uh, in a way that I think will significantly help new users. And also with the Events widget, which is the idea that when you load your dashboard in the News widget, it's been replaced so it shows some news, but it also shows nearby meetups and events. I think this could totally blow up the community uh, event side of WordPress. Cool. <laughs> As you all know, the community and kind of where we are is, is in many ways a secret sauce. It's the magic ingredient of WordPress. And so, but many people are unaware of it. It's the most common thing we hear from new people at meetups is, I didn't even know this was happening. I just kind of stumbled across it. So making those a lot more prominent, I think, is uh, going to really help connect the community all over the world. Uh, the, I think that we'll be able to do a 4.9 before we merge Gutenberg. Um, but I want, in the meantime, to get the Gutenberg plugin used by a lot of sites, ideally over 100,000, uh, before we do the merge in the core and replace the edit screen. A lot of people have a lot of things built into the edit screen. So part of the reason we're putting out there as a plugin first and also going to be pushing it so hard, trying to get as maybe p many people to install it as possible, is so that everyone who has sort of you know, posting and editing screen adjustments uh, can rethink them to be beautiful within this new framework. I think that some things that people did in like tiny MCE toolbar things aren't really needed anymore. Stuff that people did in the past with custom post types might be better as blocks. There's a lot, it gives us a real opportunity to reimagine a lot of the user interactions and flows that today we've taken for granted actually on the edit screen for about like five or six years. So what, what was the impetus behind redesigning this? Was it because the blogging itself has changed, or is, has WordPress itself changed from being a blogging platform to, to uh, a, like a web platform? Well, I do tech support for this guy called Ohm, who's been asking for this for like five years. <laughs> I still haven't used it, and I didn't get to see it, just to be clear. It was a surprise to him, too. Um, I think that I want to, you know, we've taken stabs at this before. Um, if you imagine like our previous efforts with post formats, like to make it easier to do certain types of media or quote posts or things like that, that whole concept can now flatten to just being a block. So if you had a post with just a quote block, all of a sudden that's a quote post format. Quote post format. 
Quote, post, I almost wore Fiost in there too. Yeah, like, do that it was fast, all do it fast, do it fast. <laughs> Quote, post format. Um, so working all that in, I think it's bringing things that we've been thinking about for, ev for a very, very long time in WordPress. And also that there have been some cool plugins around, like uh, Taylor was a plugin that's done some interesting things. There was another one whose name is escaping me. It had a name like Canvas or something. Someone will probably remember. People have built some things like this before. Uh, and you know, sort of not building on any of that code directly, but building on those concepts is, I think, what has allowed us to you know, get to this point and move as quickly as we have. But a lot of it's just looking around WordPress and seeing how much we're doing the same thing in different places with no sort of lot, just because we built it at different times. So for example, you are all familiar with short codes. Um, short codes don't work everywhere. <laughs> Uh, you're all familiar with widgets. Why can't I put widgets into my post? Why can't I put widgets into my footer? Like, how, why do we have these different concepts of like little blocks of content all over that can be used different ways, but aren't very discoverable, uh, have the equivalent of like an HTML UI in the case of short codes, or maybe uh, like a gallery image widget if we're lucky. And then over on the widget side, we're, you know, it's really one of the most legacy things in WordPress, because widgets go back almost 10 years at this point. And, um, a lot of those UIs haven't been rethought. That was one of the things in 4.8. Like, we had a text widget that never had WYSIWYG, <laughs> even though we've had WYSIWYG and WordPress for the better part of a decade, so, or maybe a decade at this point. So just looking around WordPress with kind of a beginner's mindset and saying, what are the screens that we've looked at a thousand times that we take for granted, but that might not make sense anymore? And this allows us a framework to completely redo all that. So just to be clear, at some point in the future, will people come to WordPress after they've downloaded it, and all they will see is this interface and then get going? I guess the way to think about it is that right now, WordPress makes you learn a lot of concepts. Short codes, widgets, kind of the stuff that exists inside tiny MCE as, as blocks today. Um, and people rightly wonder why they can't use those things everywhere. So what we're trying to do is shift it so that you only have to learn about blocks once. And once you learn about the image block, that can be in a post, that can be in a sidebar, it can be in a page, it can be wherever you want to put it, uh, in a custom post type. And that is, this, it'll work exactly the same way. And whatever is integrated with it, like let's say there's a plugin that brings in your Google Photos or your Dropbox, that'll now work everywhere too. Okay. So is it because people do think of blogging differently now that this is becoming more relevant. And what I mean by that is people blog on Facebook and people blog on Twitter and elsewhere, even on Instagram. So, and blogging isn't what used to be blogging when I started doing it, I don't know, feels like almost 17 years ago. Um, so, and now you guys are more involved in being the CMS for, you know, s stores and, and, you know, restaurants and hotels and stuff. Is that why you guys are going in this direction? Well, certainly the way plugins have been pushing WordPress is a big part of it. So imagine how much easier, like, putting WooCommerce items on a page or embedding a gravity form or a rich contact form will be when you can move these things all around. Or maybe starting to put those in sidebars with conditional views so it only shows up on one page but not another. Like, these things, the concepts just become a lot easier. The, but the, the web has moved quickly over the past few years. And I would say that right now is maybe the point since, for those of you who have been around a while, you remember when Six Apart was like utterly dominant and kind of the arch nemesis of WordPress in a lot of ways. We're probably at the point when we have more competition than we ever had in the past from the proprietary side, uh, from the you know, Wixes and Squarespaces of the world, Weebly as well. Um, on the open source side, with Drupal 8, which has been doing some really neat things, and some other open source platforms as well. And then finally, just on the like general like web content building, whether or mobile content building. You were an investor, was it called Storyhouse? Mm -hmm. uh, a really beautiful, like especially on the iPad app, that allowed you to drag and drop elements and rearrange things to create like a, a rich story experience. We have uh, magazines, whether they're online ones like you know, Vox or Recode or uh, The Verge or like what the New York Times pioneered with their Snowfall story. Like showing like really rich interactive stories uh, 
you can do that now with this editor. And I could even, even imagine something like, uh, did any of y'all see the Bloomberg code issue? Anyone see this? It was mo quite possibly the most amazing thing I've ever read online. There's this awesome guy called Paul Ford. And for Bloomberg Business Week, a business-oriented magazine, he did an article on code. And I think it was the entire print magazine. But when you looked online, the article was actually an interactive, like JavaScript-driven, teaching you how to code thing. So it was both taking you through the history of code, WordPress is mentioned a few times. And then as you go, there's like little exercises with like real-time debugging, <laughs> where you can like move things around or animate a hand to wave. Or, and when you get to the end of it, it told you how much time you spent on the article. <laughs> I left it open in a tab, so it kind of broke it. I left it open for like a month, so I was like, you spent 9,000 hours on this article. <laughs> so it's, it was, but it was pretty amazing. Um, you're not going to do that out of the box with uh, Gutenberg, but you can completely imagine Gutenberg plus a cool plugin allowing you to build something like that. And then post and pages evolve. And I think that's where the independent web really has the opportunity to distinguish itself from kind of the cookie cutter, what social media platforms allow you to do, be it Facebook or Tumblr or Twitter or Instagram. You know, you can't even have links in Instagram. Doesn't mean that they're not cool, but I think that as these platforms onboard people and as billions of people come online, they'll be like, uh, like the training wheels. You know, they'll get people to understand the power uh, of publishing online and sharing, and, but also their limitations will be things that the, the best people on these platforms will run into pretty quickly. Well, I think, you know, one of the people I've been talking to recently described the, the uh, Facebook and Google and others like the McDonald's, basically one menu for everyone, and you can pick and choose what you want from that menu, but that's about it. But, you know, there's still many more people eat at McDonald's. We may, you know, scoff at it, but they do. And, and from that standpoint, I think shouldn't Facebook, uh, as, uh, the WordPress as a community be looking at how do we figure out a way to work with things like Facebook to bring in what is the crucial part of Facebook, which is the, the social graph, the network? Because at the end of the day, the blogging today or you know, creating websites for business is a different thing. But from a blogging standpoint, which may be a decreasing uh, you know, segment, what really makes the difference, especially in the independent web, is that people should be able to discover your content more easily and read it more easily. So is there a way for you guys to work with somebody like Facebook to kind of push that idea? So I think the integrations with social networks are really important. And WordPress being Swiss, meaning we can work with everything, is a, is a key advantage that we have there versus you know, some of the, the guys that are fighting each other, the big giant companies that are fighting each other. That, with the philosophical sort of uh, rails that we've chosen for WordPress currently, that wouldn't be something that happens in core. It'll be something that happens in plugins. Jetpack being an obvious and popular example, but many others as well that do deeper integrations or targeted things with the social network, social media, and the big ones that are supported in things like Jetpack, but also all around the world. You know, we have a very international crew here. There's lots of other social networks and things that uh, maybe aren't to the threshold where they're built into one of the more popular plugins. But in a given country, that might be a very popular integration. Right. Are you thinking about figuring out a way to publish from WordPress into, let's say, WeChat or WhatsApp or Telegram? And if yes, when? I've been really fascinated by the messaging platforms. Uh, Telegram is my personal favorite. But of course, I recognize like the utter dominance of things like WeChat and other markets. Um, yeah, I think it's pretty cool. Telegram has a new sort of groups broadcast feature that I think is a really cool way to follow blogs. And we're doing some experiments with that inside Automatic. So there's definitely some stuff that could, uh, that could come down the line there. Can we do that earlier than Gutenberg? <laughs> I guess that gets back to when Gutenberg's coming in. Yeah, exactly. OK. When is Question that I dodged. Coming? No, because I think the, the, the world of information is now, the consumption is happening not just inside the traditional web browser. That's what I mean is that, so the, the, the great way to think about WordPress is, WordPress becomes the information router. It takes information from my head and publishes into all these different platforms. And it, it stays my homestead, 
but you know, it can still go other places. The content I mean, or information I create. That's what I mean, it's like all, you know, like it, the difference between what blogging was 17 years ago and what it is today is that like people don't go to a place to read a blog, they just need to be sent the information to get that blog, you know. So that's why I'm thinking, is that part of the, the long-term thinking at WordPress just now? Uh, absolutely, and I think that part of it is if we look at one, some of the cool things that made blogs such a rich interaction on early days, uh, feed readers and RSS, a way to openly follow and get notified of everything out there, uh, blog rolls, unfortunately of which the code is still in core, but you know, this idea that you, know, you can link to your favorite sites and so there's discovery mechanisms, think of it like related blogs. Like, I think there's a ton we can do there. Um, but I think that we have to make the user experience of following and reading and consuming these sites as smooth and as fast as it is when you're in the closed garden of a social network. I think we can actually do a little bit better. Uh, I think that some technologies that I embrace um, hesitantly, like say AMP from Google, Accelerated Mobile Pages, actually do provide a really cool framework to create a more distributed Facebook, a more distributed take on, or more independent take on what we want to read and consume and follow. Um, and I think that is something we've all woken up to, especially in the past year or two with the political cycle. Uh, the social networks, as a means of distribution, do influence uh, how people think, how people react, uh, what, you know, the information that we put in, just like the food you eat influences your health, the information that we eat and consume influences our mindsets and our happiness and what we want to do and the actions we take. And so I think that we're going to be, want to be much more thoughtful. The McDonald's Facebook analogy actually works on a whole different level than I think we even intended it when we started. But to stretch it just a little bit further, um, you know, fate, or McDonald's is what's called the largest restaurant in the world. I'm just making this up because I don't know the food stats. And a lot of people eat there. But I bet if you added up all the other restaurants in the world, it would dwarf all the other food consumed every day. McDonald's would be less than 1%. And I think that's what the web can create, is we have this ability um, to create something that is highly distributed, but in aggregate uh, becomes the real driving force of humanity's interaction with each other. So I'm going to go back to what one thing you just said earlier during our conversation, that if you look at a screen a thousand times in a, in a, in a year, you kind of you know, become very familiar with it and can't see it from a user's new a beginner's standpoint. And that's why Gutenberg is such, such an influential thing. Similarly, when you look at the internet today, you have all these people who keep talking about the open web, the independent web, but they don't see things from the average user's perspective. How do you make an average person care for the open web or, or the independent web as we call it? Mostly because they just think all about the web as Facebook and say, well, we go there, all our friends are there, and all our enemies are there, so we can just hang out in one place. And so they, it, it just actually, when I think about the open web, and, you know, and I want open web to flourish, but when you think about it from like, you know, the, the new internet users, do they really care? Well, I think something that it goes back to the very early days of WordPress is that we strongly believed and I personally believed in the uh, morality of open source and the GPL, and that it's a better thing for humanity, it's a better thing for the world, I want everything I do to be open source, but also there was the recognition from the very beginning that we weren't going to uh, make the web run by open source software by going out there seeing how superior open source is. Right? We actually had to make a better experience, and we had to beat the proprietary systems at their own game. We had to actually be better than them, not just in license and in morality, but in like the day-to-day -day functioning of how you interact with the software. That's, I believe, how WordPress beat Six of Parts, which was a far better funded, larger, 
um, more institutionally supported, everything competitor. Um, we beat it not just by being open, but by being better. And being open is part of being better, but it is a, uh, what is it, necessary but not sufficient condition uh, to what we ultimately, the web that we want to create, the web that we want our children to grow up with, which I don't think looks like, I don't have any children yet, so I got a little extra time, but I don't think it looks like the currently sort of uh, large company dominated Facebook et al. Uh, version of what we're seeing today. So what does it look like to you five years from now or 10 years from now? I think if you can ha take the best of the user experience of some of these platforms, but have it bring together things from all over the web so that there is, or even if, you, if there is an algorithm determining on what you see or what's most popular, that you can see how that algorithm works, that you know the data going into it. Um, we're in kind of a very strange spot right now where we're going to have cars driving themselves that we don't know how it works, that the, the algorithms and the code driving that car is not going to be public. And more importantly, for machine learning systems, the data behind it is proprietary. So it's going to be a black box, perhaps even to the developers of those systems, to why it makes certain decisions, why it works the way it does. Cars are easy. They're obvious because... You know, you can see them moving around. Inevitably, by the way, I'm a fan of self-driving cars. They'll be vastly safer than humans. Inevitably, there'll be an accident. People will die. It's just, it's part of the, the large of law numbers. But it, I think that sort of more physical instantation of this machine learning algorithm-driven world will help wake us up to how much our minds are being driven by the algorithms that determine what news we see every day. No, let's, let's so I want to see how that works. Yeah. So I just want to take, give you an example, okay? Sure. So if somebody was five years old in 2000 when I started blogging, and they will be, what, 22 now, right? And their idea of a blog is very different from what is my idea of a blog 17 years ago. So somebody who's like maybe five or 10 years old now, in 10 years from now, they will be 20, 21. And, and they are the kids who are growing up using iPads or you know, Android pads, and, and they're talking to Alexa and Siri and things like that. What does a platform like WordPress evolve into 10 years from now when kids who have who are going to grow up and they have not really, you know, touch and voice and gestures are their primary way of interacting with the information and not text, which is what the open web is all about. It's very textual. It's very, you know, like link centric. How does it evolve into that? How do we overcome the limitations of user experience? It's a good question, and it's an interesting thought experiment. So if we were to like fast forward 10 or 15 years, uh, I'll say one assumption, which might be a place we disagree, that I think text will, text and things on a screen, even if that screen is on our glasses or something else, will still be a key, or visually consumed information will still be a key part of it. So I do not believe that voice-driven interfaces um, are gonna be able to have the density to do what we consume so much. Uh, so let's assume there's still screens. Um, you know, I might wake up, uh, future, you know, today five-year-old and the future 20-year-old. Uh, I have a beautiful device, maybe with a bendable OLED. I launch an open source application, maybe WordPress, maybe something else, that can then go out to all of the people I follow. Um, celebrities are now using WordPress because it's easy enough for them to use. Because the Gutenberg version 10 is so easy that even you know, the most uh, challenged celebrity <laughs> could use it to post music or embarrassing pictures of themselves or selfies. And they're doing it because, as opposed to one of the social networks, because they control the follower list, they can take it with them, they're not beholden. They've been burnt when Instagram version 23 decided that you had to pay to reach your followers. And so the Kardashians of the world or their children have now moved on to other things. Um, <laughs> the, I have a choice in my sort of app whether I want to see ads, let's say I have more time than money, or if I have more money than time, I filled up like a blockchain-based, let's call it Bitcoin for the sake of uh, argument, wallet 
that gives like a little micro transaction to everything I consume or like or share with my friends. And so there's a business model for everyone out there that doesn't have to be driven by you know, users being sold to companies that sell more things. Um, I think that then I message using open protocols with all my friends. So I'm not tied into something that only works on iPhone like iMessage or something that's tied to one particular or that's sort of mined like a Gmail or Facebook Messenger. I think that that is an instant, distributed, and fully encrypted uh, transaction. My phone is also fully secure. It's locked with several biometrics and, and so encrypted that like, even if a, a state actor had it in their physical possession, it would be hard for them to get data out of it. I mean, we can imagine this current trends playing out to that. Um, and then, you know, WordPress version 14 <laughs> is the technology behind all this. Uh, you know, if I buy something from, you know, the Kardashian's grandchild that's selling something on their, you know, uh, distributed network, maybe that goes through open source software as well. Instead of going to Amazon, it can go through a WooCommerce or whatever other plugins take it. You, you can imagine these things playing out, but if and only if we make the user experience better. Well. I'm glad you're more optimistic about the future and the open web <laughs> because, you know, it will need a lot of hope and optimism and, you know, wild imagination to, to do that because the open web is competing with very deep-pocketed um, um, players with very short arms. You know, they don't, they don't like to share. They like to take all the time. So... I will go, I'm going to stop asking you questions, otherwise I'll just eat into everybody else's time. And I would rather have the audience ask questions from you and to you, and, and then if they don't, then I'll come back again. I have a lot of questions for you, by the way. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so far. So I think ready? we have some mics up front that people can go to. So if you, if you go, there's one over there and one over there. And... Uh, I'll point and then we'll kind of rotate between them or, or go. I guess uh, say your name and also because we're at WordCamp Europe, just where you're from because that's pretty interesting. And we'll start right over here since you got there first. Oh, we might need to turn the mic on. Maybe on that side too. Make sure it's on. <laughs> oh, 25 years in the future, we'll still have problems Hello. with mics though. <laughs> All right. Here we go. I'm, I'm Norbert. I'm coming from Germany now. Um, in my opinion, every website is a search engine. Uh, WordPress.com, for example, if I want to discover a new blog post, I can go to discover WordPress. If I want to discover tags, I can go to WordPress.com slash tags. It's a search engine. Every website is a search engine. In my opinion, search engine optimization should be something the WordPress community develops. Is this on, on the map? And if it is, can it go higher on the map so that proprietary algorithms and secret algorithms no longer guide users on the web? Ooh, that's a tough one. So, and to make sure I'm understanding correctly, you don't mean like the equivalent of Yoast and Core, but you mean like building a Google, WordPress us building is, like a Google. WordPress is the search engine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I do think that we can, I mean, one thing about WordPress is we've always had a foot in the idealism and a foot in the pragmatism of what's possible in today's technology. Um, that's why things like Jetpack exist, to kind of bridge us between what's allowable today on like a distributed web host that costs five or 10 bucks a month and what we think is gonna be required in the future. So for example, every Jetpack site has uh, access to Elasticsearch API, which gives them a much richer form of querying and ranking and related posts and everything uh, for all of the content on their site that you can't really do with MariaDB or MySQL um, today. So on a per site basis, that is there today in kind of like a, an in-between way, right? You need a plug-in, it's a hosted service, but in the future, as you know, Moore's Law continues, that'll be something you can run on the $5 a month web host. And of course, with Jetpack, we open source everything, so that'll be available. Elasticsearch itself is open source. Now, in terms of going cross-site, though, meaning that you, you sort of map through things, um, I'm not aware of technology that makes that really easy today. 
But I wonder if you know you take sort of the conclusion uh, or the logical conclusion of our open APIs, the next versions of things like GraphQL, and some sort of federation, where be it DNS-based or other ways that you could kind of go out there. Um, you could have sites that tie together better than they do today. But at the end of the day, if you're going to do a search of everything out there, you need to store that someplace <laughs> for it to complete in a reasonable amount of time. It, does, it wouldn't have to be a one-size-fits-all engine. Discover works differently than tags do. And I think maybe people could also develop their own algorithms and have different, different algorithms available. References, yeah. Cool. And thank you for the question. You're very forward-thinking. All right, let's go Hello. over to the right here. Uh, hi, Matt. It's Alec Knier from Folio Vision in Bratislava in Slovakia. Um, I hate long questions, uh, so I'll try and keep this short. It's, a, it's about ethics of open source, so it's going to just take a second. You guys bought WooCommerce and have done amazing things with it. I mean, it's uh, the marketing and the support and all of the systems that you've put into place with the team working on WooCommerce are amazing even from what was a plugin which was running well commercially before uh, you bought it. The one thing which worries me in the WooCommerce acquisition was not your acquisition of WooCommerce from Woo. You paid them $26 million to take their crown jewel and do something much bigger with it, which is easier for a company with auto like Automatic with such huge reach. But what bothers me is uh, the original creators, uh, they moved with the product, the, the, the coders moved with the product, but the people who spent five years developing it, I think it was Gigoshop, ended up with nothing from the Woo uh, deal. And I'm wondering how you feel about that process of sort of open source being subverted in that some people put a lot of time and money into something and basically had their developers nipped and ended up in a way, taking, uh, taking a huge loss. And so it's your reaction to that. An alternative reaction would be, when you paid $26 million to Woo, why not give $2 million to the Jigo Shop people and say, thank you, you guys did amazing work supporting these guys, uh, Mike Jolly, or I think is his name, and the other developer to get where they are. And just thank you so much. And that would seem to me somehow a more equitable arrangement and so it's a really deep open source dilemma, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. It's a good and interesting question, so thank you for bringing it. Um, I must admit that I'm not like, intimately familiar with the, because it was many, many years before the acquisition of kind of the Jigo Shop to WooCommerce, the subtleties there. I know that some of the developers who worked on Jigo Shop then moved over uh, to what at the time was WooThemes. But I do think in general that when you, know, when you buy something in open source, Obviously, when we did that acquisition for an unconfirmed amount, um, you, <laughs> you're not buying the code. If Automatic just wanted the code, we could have downloaded WooCommerce and had it all. It's all open source. I mean, that's one of the beauties. They could also sell it, but that wasn't the thing that we were trying to bring into the, to the core of Automatic's DNA. It was the people. You know, 53 people joined the company, uh, joined Automatic. It was the brands, you know, the brand of WooCommerce. It was the integrations and the meetups and the, you know, everything that they had built uh, since then, which, from what I know, did accrue largely to when it was in its WooCommerce days. It didn't have as much of that, the extensions and everything else when it was in this, uh, the GigoShop days. To be honest, I found out about GigoShop uh, before the acquisition, but a little bit later. I had heard about WooCommerce for a while, and I think I'd seen the controversy originally when it happened, but um, it was more like in diligence, and I was learning about everything, and I read through the WooCommerce blog going back to like the first post. I was like, oh, this thing happened. But I guess you can make the same argument of you know, WordPress itself being a fork of V2. At some point, if you build enough on the code, and I'm not saying what is the right answer there, because I would need to dig into more to what actually happened. But at some point, the beauty of open source is you can take the code, build on it enough that it becomes something that is wholly different. Um, I guess you have sort of a Theseus ship question there. And um, we don't yet have an equity model that reflects contributions to code over time. Um, you know, when a web host gets bought, like let's say Media Temple, and half or more of the revenue is coming from WordPress-powered sites, 
but all the people who worked on WordPress don't receive any of that acquisition. I think that's, that's just something that's going to happen and something you have to be comfortable with when you put your code out there as open source. In the future, there might be something around like blockchains or initial coin offerings or something like that, which allows people to sort of actually have an equity in what moves with code. But I don't think that we even have the technical underpinnings for that really widely available today. The one thing that worries me is... I'm going to open it up for other questions, just because we have a long line here. and not. Thanks for the answer. But thank you for asking a, a cool one. <laughs> All right, we'll bounce over here. Hello, Matt. Hello. I'm Sarah Gooding from WP Tavern. And That's not a country. I've, yeah, it will be someday. Um, I've got a question, um, continuing that conversation about the open web. There's been quite a bit of discussion surrounding Google's AMP project, Accelerated Mobile Pages, for the past year or so. And there are many who believe that it's actually harmful to the open web because it forces users to load JavaScript from their site, um, loads the cache content from its own servers, and uses a subset of HTML that optimizes pages to benefit Google and Google's users. WordPress.com was one of the first publishers to partner with Google on this initiative to speed up the mobile web, but Automatic's official plugin hasn't been updated for eight months. My question is, how is Google AMP good for the open web, and will Automatic continue to support Google's initiative? Whew. Okay, so there's some pluses and minuses. The things I like about AMP are that it removes a lot of cruft, and it's ultra-fast. Like now in search results, if I see an AMP link, I'm more likely to click on that than other things because I, I know it's going to load really fast. I know I'm not going to get some sort of weird pop-up that redirects my browser to the App Store or anything like that. So that, I think, is good and necessary. Um, it is kind of amazing that Google is driving this. Like, I don't know if you all saw the news that Google's going to build an ad blocking to Chrome next year. <laughs> like, it's almost like we're in a bizarre world for actually so many reasons, but Google doing ad blocking is definitely a bizarre world thing. Like, I feel like I'm maybe not in the correct parallel universe, like something's forked. Um, what I dislike about it uh, are the things you mentioned. So AMP itself, the specification, doesn't require it to be loaded from Google servers. But that's currently how a lot of implementations work. And um, I don't like how the share URL then becomes Google.something. I think it's bad for phishing, as we've seen some pretty, a very smart attack on Gmail or Google Drive recently. So those have some downsides. I think that those can be worked out. So something, you know, WordPress is very early in adopting uh, responsiveness, responsive pages, and also some plugins, including built into Jetpack itself, that do a mobile version of the site, do create a better experience. And I think a big reason of why people have adopted WordPress in the past. AMP is the next version of that. It is more open and standard than what we've done in the past. And I could see it becoming a, uh, a much more inclusive thing than it is. And given that that is Automatic's, one of Automatic's core principles as well, we're going to work with Google to try to push it that direction and try to bring a lot of the web along with it. Because you know, the alternatives out there, like say Facebook's proprietary instant articles format, are not necessarily better, especially if they tie you into say one form of monetization, like Facebook's ads. So I do believe that AMP has the potential to be a much more open and in line with WordPress's ideals version of that. But it is imperfect as it stands today. Can I just ask a follow-up on that? Sure. Uh, you have mostly, a mic, so. Yeah. I think the AMP, you as a, as a group, WordPress as, an, as a big, massive entity on the internet, basically should force Google to give people their own servers to do AMP on their own servers as part of you know, implementation. I think when you are roughly 26% of the web's traffic, they, you have way more control on, on how they behave. And you could be the user, be, a, be, you know, a cop on the behalf of users and privacy and independence, in my opinion. I mean, you know, thank you, Sarah, for asking that question, because I'm in your camp on little skepticism around AMP. I hope that we, that's a very good idea, and I hope that we can always be an advocate on behalf of users yes. in everything we do. Yeah. Over here to the right. Okay. No? Yeah. Oh, oh, hi, Matt. I'm Kevin, and I'm from Bristol, England. Um, I, was, I like what I saw at Gutenberg, yeah. But is it heavily influenced by Wix and Divi? Because I don't have any problems editing on, in WordPress, but some of my friends who are not familiar with it do, and they like Divi and 
in Wix well because they can edit so easily? Um, I think it's definitely informed by things that have come before, but we're trying to leapfrog them. We're not trying to catch up to what these people have now or did a few years ago. We're trying to go to where the puck is, uh, skate to where the puck is going, to use a hockey metaphor, even though I've only seen one hockey game in my life. Uh -huh. um, so that is, is the main idea. And I, the hope is that not just that it's easier and more intuitive for new users, but it actually allows power users to do things faster. And so that's really, with WordPress and its history, we, the, the balance we've tried to walk. We're being intuitive and accessible for new people. We're allowing folks, like many of you all here in this room, to maybe do the things that you used to do, but much faster than before. So yeah, definitely informed. Okay. Thank, Thank you for the question. Over here on the left. Hi, uh, I'm Jonathan uh, from Los Angeles. I work at DreamHost. Um, Thank you so much, Om, for asking the question about the open web. Um, it's something that really resonates with me personally. I've spent a lot of time, like a lot of people in the room, begrudgingly on social media and in these silos, right? Um, but mainly because of convenience and interaction. Um, and I believe uh, as well that with the leadership position that WordPress has and the ideals that the WordPress community has, there's a real opportunity to kind of flip social networking on its head, right? Um, I've seen a lot of really cool work going on lately around the micro.blog project, if you're familiar, mm -hmm. and some of the stuff that the W3C is doing with things like web mention, which allows you to have your sites actually interact with each other. Um, and it's starting to build out, like I can see this future and I'm really excited about it, but I haven't really seen WordPress take a leadership position. I've seen it kind of watching and observing. So I just wanted to see if you've been tracking those things and if you think the community should embrace it as well. Um, I have been tracking those things. I do think that there's other things we need to embrace and figure out beforehand. It doesn't matter if we won 28% of the web if we can only get a third of that to upgrade to the latest version. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter. Like you know, a lot of these things happen. It doesn't matter if we could, you know, create a distributed reader that spiders everything out if that's going to be shut down by web host for using too many resources. So uh, I think that it's more of I raise it as something for the community to keep in mind. We have something magical, which is a business model which is not advertising driven. I say the we globally, like as people building on WordPress services, automatic certainly. Um, so I think that is the thing that will allow us to, first we need to build a better user experience. If you want people to use something instead of a newsfeed, it has to be as engaging as their newsfeed. But two, because you're not advertising driven, then can you open that up in some interesting way? Um, yes. And so, but if you don't do that first thing, it doesn't matter. You know, Jason talked about like the perfect software that no one uses. Right. Um, it doesn't matter if something supports every single possible web standard and format and everything. If no one's using it, then it's you know it's a standard falling in a forest. So yeah, I agree with you. I'm I'm excited about seeing WordPress help drive these things though. So, but the great answer. Thank you so much. So we can only take two more questions. Uh, is that the all right? Uh, the, I got the hand wave. I got the hand wave. Okay, I'll try to do lightning round. So if you can ask a quick question, I will give you a quick answer, and maybe we'll get through four of them, but we'll see. I, I'll keep an eye on the watch. Hello, my name is Jackie. I'm from San Francisco, and I'm concerned about freedom of speech. Theresa May promised to clamp down uh, on, on the web, and uh, the FCC chair is looking to get rid of net neutrality. I'm uh, optimistic about our community leading uh, efforts in the open web, and so I'm curious to uh, see what you have to say about WordPress uh, maintaining an open web, and uh, specifically about automatic, uh, perhaps revisiting the freedom of speech page uh, that you have up that is, um, to me personally, a, a vague on how uh, hate speech is treated. So curious about that. Ooh, that's a tough one, because at the same time, we're dealing with like fake news and other you know, misleading, deliberately misleading or high, harmful to society things happening out there. Um, I'll have to look at our freedom of speech page. I probably haven't read it in a little while, but I would say that constitutionally, myself and Automatic and a lot of people in this room are very, very much attached to that concept as a company based in the US, which I guess used to be more of a good thing, but like the First Amendment and all these sort of things that allow for this, um, we'll fight for that. And we have gone to court before to fight for, I think it was a user in the UK. Um, we've spent money on legal resources where we submit, you know, 
opinions to Supreme Court cases. Like, we're definitely trying to stay as active as possible there. I'm going to end there only because I want to get to as many of these. So, but thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Hendrik. I'm from uh, Munich, Germany. And last year in Vienna, I believe you talked about the possibility of WordPress being the operating system of the web. Um, how far do you think we've got in the last 12 years and, and uh, to, to that becoming reality? Because 28% is 28%. And in the mobile market, we have operating system op uh, operating far under that threshold. So how are we on the oper operating system on the web? I think we are doing well, but you know, I'll go back to upgrades like I talked about earlier. Like a key thing of being an operating system is having a, a way to have people on the latest and greatest. Security becomes a huge issue. And for us, I think that something I'm very excited about, now that Gutenberg is in such a good place, um, customization is going to kick off relatively soon. Um, one of the areas that I'm going to shift my attention to a little bit, and that we talked about in the community summit, is looking at plugins and themes and how we can ensure that those are as up to date and also as uh, have something closer to the standards and attention that we pay to core in terms of the code quality, the code style, the scalability, and the security of them. So keep an eye out. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ciprian. I'm from Romania. Uh, two years ago, almost two years ago, you recommended encouraged the entire WordPress community to learn JavaScript deeply. It's now 2017. How would you evalu evaluate the overall progress? And on a strategic level, do you see mobile apps as being the next growth opportunity for WordPress ecosystem, just like blogs and websites were more than two, 10 years ago? Hmm. Who has learned JavaScript deeply so far? Who still needs to? <laughs> yep. <laughs> it looks like we're about half of the way there. Um, with Gutenberg and the things that follow it, I think that will shift more and more of the WordPress interface to be JavaScript driven. So, you know, as a percentage, I feel like this is going to be, if you think about writing, editing, and customization, there you cover, I would say, 70 or 80% of the crucial tasks that people do in WP Admin every day. So, that being in this modern JavaScript space, um, I believe that the team is, I don't know if they've chosen a framework yet, but let's call it Reactor View. Um, it's there. So I would say that as soon as Gutenberg is out there, or today, um, start digging into that code, because that is going to be the sort of nucleus of what becomes JavaScript throughout WP Admin, um, or maybe like the Calypso-like replacement for WP Admin in the future. So we're doing OK, but could do a lot better. OK. All right. Got one. Wow, now it's 55. All right. We are pretty Thank late, you pretty so much. Yeah. <laughs> you should do a pop-up chat with people afterwards. Yeah, and if, you, uh, if, you, if we didn't get to your question, I apologize. We had a few people in line. If you tweet it to me, um, I will do my best to answer it uh, or link to an answer if it takes more than 140 characters. So Great. Thank, thank you. you very much. I really appreciate you all. Thank you so much. Thank you.